1845, an expedition set sail from the familiar waters of Britain. Helmed by veteran explorer Sir John Franklin, the aim of this expedition was simple. Find the Northwest Passage in the Canadian Arctic to secure a revolutionary trade route for the crown. There were high hopes for the expedition, yet not long after it had begun, the ships and the men on board vanished off the face of the earth, leaving only frozen bones and the echoes of immeasurable suffering to haunt the icy wastes. Join us today on Mystery Archives as we explore the tragedy and the horror of the Franklin Expedition. On the 28th of May, 1847, HMS ships Yerbus and Terror floated in the ice, having wintered in 1846 to 1847 at Beachy Island after having ascended the Wellington Channel. They then returned by the west side of Cornwallis Island with Sir John Franklin commanding the expedition, Lieutenant Graham Gore. 25th of April, 1848. Her Majesty's ships Terror and Erebus were deserted on the 22nd of April, having been beset since the 12th of September, 1846. The officers and crews, consisting of 105 souls under the command of Captain Crozier, landed here. This paper was found by Lieutenant Irving under the cairn supposed to have been built by Sir James Ross in 1831, where it had been deposited by the late Commander Gore in May of 1847. Sir John Franklin died on the 11th of June, 1847, and the total loss by deaths in the expedition has been to this date nine officers and 15 men. James Fitzjames, captain of the HMS Erebus, and Francis Crozier, captain and senior officer, and start on tomorrow, the 26th, for Back Fish River. These words were found written on the same note, which was deposited in a stone cairn, and are one of the few pieces of evidence that remain. How could one of the most well-equipped expeditions of the day experience such a disaster and then seemingly vaporize in the icy waters of northeastern Canada? Few direct evidence remains, but in the centuries since their disappearance, explorers have unearthed evidence that could finally put the enigma to rest. Since there is so much fog covering the truth behind the vanishing of over a hundred brave men, what do we know? Well, let's start at the beginning. After the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, British naval supremacy was world-renowned. The Crown boasted top-of-the-line maritime technology and an ambitious empire that stretched across the globe, with trade routes linked with Asia. However, trade with Asia would often be costly, time-consuming, or even dangerous. Given the Spanish presence in South America and the need for more efficient and safer passage to Asia, something had to be done. Captain Cook and George Vancouver were sent upon their own expeditions as early as the late 1700s. Post 1815, the search for the mythical Northwest Passage resumed in earnest. By 1840, no fewer than 13 separate expeditions had hunted the chilled lands of west of Greenland, known today as Nunavut. The need for this exploration was essential for geography and safe travel. Without it, no further strides for science would be possible. By 1845, only a small portion remained to be explored, and it was into those unknown waters that the expedition was ordered to charge straight into. Sir John Franklin was intent on discovering the passage at any cost. Sir John was a seemingly excellent choice for the mission, 
a veteran naval captain, an Arctic explorer. This last expedition would have been a surefire way to relive the glory of his previous days and provide the sharp wisdom of his 59 years. He was a devout Christian man who cared deeply for the well-being of his men under his charge. Sir John was well received by all who knew him and generally loved by the men under his command. However, Sir John was far from the best option. Sir John was described as portly and did not handle cold weather well. In addition, he possessed a tendency to rush headlong into situations without taking into account the greater surroundings or his limitations. The first expedition he led in 1819 nearly met with disaster. 11 out of his 22 men died by starvation and there were accusations of murder and even cannibalism. The others were forced to eat lichen, deer bones, and shoe leather. But they survived after being rescued by a local tribe. As a result of his efforts, Franklin was renowned as the man who ate his boots. Because of Franklin's age and physical condition, the Admiralty hesitated to appoint him to the lead expedition. However, under the pressures of Franklin's wife, Lady Jane, they reluctantly agreed. The expedition would use top-of-the-line ships. Her Majesty's ship Eurybus, captained by Franklin and James Fitzjames, and Her Majesty's ship Terror, captained by another Arctic veteran, Captain Crozier. These ships possessed steam engines for movement, as well as indoor heating. In addition to this was another recent invention, canned food. With three years worth of supplies, over 130 men, the best technology of the age, and the goodwill of their countrymen, the prospects of the expedition certainly started off optimistic. In spite of the rose-tinted glasses of the public and crew, several unsettling omens marked the mission before it had even begun. Sir John had been afflicted with a terrible influenza and had not even recovered by the time the ships were set to sail. He had allegedly awakened to the sight of the Union Jack having been draped over him by Lady Jane, something which appalled him as the Union Jack was used to cover dead soldiers. Prophetic still were the names of the ships themselves. Terror, which comes from the Latin terrer, which means to frighten, and Erebus, the darkness before the gates of hell. After departure, the ships sailed towards Greenland. Their journey was marked by rough and stormy seas, and after resupplying and relieving a few men who were made invalid and sending them home, the last sight of the expedition by Europeans was in Baffin Bay in July of 1845, as the ships were waiting for better conditions. The ships spent the winter at Beachy Island, where they buried three of their number in stone cairns. When the ice finally broke up in 1846, they continued their journey. However, this was when their luck began to take a turn for the worst. By September, both ships were trapped in slow-moving packed ice from the north, just off the coast of King William Island. Stranded in one of the most inhospitable places known to man, with little to no game, the expedition was faced with hardships unimaginable. They wintered in the ice till 1847, all the while experiencing sub-zero temperatures, frostbite, and fatigue. One must imagine just how alien such a place would have been for these men, an endless sea of ice, near constant night, and the haunting moans of the pack beneath them, and above it all the aurora borealis lighting the sky with ghostly glows. In the spring of 47, the ice showed no signs of breaking up, and the captain sent search parties in every direction to find land or any indication of open water. The party led by Lieutenant Gore found the stone cairn on King William Island and deposited a record detailing the events thus far. Mere days after the party returned, Sir John Franklin died of causes unknown, leaving the command to pass to Captain Crozier. Francis Radon Miora Crozier had seen plenty of action in the Arctic, his most famous exploit being the Ross expedition to Antarctica in 1839, with ironically both the HMS Erebus and Terror. 
This previous mission, however, did not suffer the same ill fortunes that he must have found himself confronting. Forced to winter for yet another year, and with 1848 bringing no signs of ice breakup, the decision was made to abandon the ships in the ice and go on foot to rescue. It was during this land expedition that the second note in the Cairn Stone was written. Crozier's goal seemed to be to reach Baxfish River and make it safely from there. Baxfish River was unfortunately hundreds of miles away. It was on this long and final walk that their true troubles began. There were many factors that stacked layer upon layer to manifest a perfect storm that led to the deaths of these men. Even after they left the ice and landed on King William Island, they found no relief. The environment was a cold and rocky desert that stretched on endlessly. The little game, like seals and polar bears, contained a strain of botulism and other potential dangers such as trichinosis. These could wreak havoc on the body, causing fever, pain, fatigue, swelling, and even paralysis. In addition, the years of consuming canned foods had produced more problems. The tins were improperly soldered, leading to spoiled food and lead poisoning. It is also possible that the ships utilized lead-lined plumbing, which could have contributed to the toxicity that afflicted the crew. The lack of fresh food over years likely led to a proliferation of scurvy, and all of these conditions certainly gave rise to skin diseases, infections, tuberculosis, and pneumonia. Starvation and dehydration only served to top off their long list of sufferings. But the worst of all was time. Lead poisoning had to build up over months and years. Fatigue, injury, death, and disease were made worse the longer they were trapped without aid. The journey to the south was too much for men already broken by the hell that they had been forced to endure. Dragging heavy sledges across rough stone or carrying the sick would have become impossible as everyone became weak or ill. Eventually, one by one, the men began to drop like flies. The older crew members and officers would have been the most likely to die first, leaving only the younger men who would have separated. Forty or so men managed to make it to the northern shores of the continent, where they all breathed their last breaths, still hundreds of miles from rescue. And that is the end of their tale. But is that the real story? The truth is, we don't truly know yet what happened to the entirety of the expedition's crew. But we do have a speculation based off artifacts, bodies, letters, documents, and accounts from the local Inuit tribes in the area. Interviews with native people have revealed that some of the men did indeed make contact with them. They looked starved and sick, but moved on. Other testimonies talk of scattered human flesh, skulls, and corpses with their hands cut off. In addition, bodies were found with marks cut deep into the bone. Cannibalism was certainly a grim possibility, but has been a large point of contention for historians. Beyond that, the local people state that King William Island is cursed, haunted by the restless spirits of the men who died there. It would be years before searches for Sir John's lost expedition happened in mass. However, it would not be till 2014 and 2016 when both ships were found, well preserved, beneath the waves miles away from their original supposed resting place. This has called into question the entire narrative of the land expedition. Did some men choose to return to the ships in an attempt to sail out? Some Inuit accounts describe men being on board the ships before they sank, so it is possible that the evidence certainly suggests more than initially believed. The legacy of Sir John Franklin's expedition has haunted the world for centuries, spawning art, music, books, and movies, as well as a television series. The hunt for the truth about this centuries-old mystery has driven many professionals alike to investigate so that their story might not be forgotten. Not all of this story is horrible. As a result of their efforts, the Franklin expedition mapped out more of the land than they could have ever imagined if they had managed to reach rescue. They accomplished their goal of helping to find the Northwest Passage, but they did not succeed in coming home. They did, however, leave a legacy, 
a legacy that echoes throughout the history of man and shall not be forgotten. Should there be any who say of these Arctic expeditions, to what purpose have they been? I should desire them to compare our present map of that region and of the northern coast of America with that of 1818 when these expeditions commenced. They will find in the latter only three points marked on the coast of America and nothing to the northward of it. Surely it cannot be denied that so large an addition to the geography of the northern parts of America and of the Arctic regions is in itself an object worthy of all the efforts that have been made in the course of former expeditions. I have the honor to be, my lord, your lordship's most obedient servant. John Franklin, 24th of January, 1845.